we will have Anne Claire Slama, mm -hmm. and the the title of the presentation is the influence of matrix properties and embedded lengths on the pullout behavior of yarns in cement calcareous filler matrices. And well, I think Anahi can start. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Krasnama. I am a PhD student in CY Sergi Paris University. And today uh, I'm here to talk about a small part of my PhD work, uh, which is the influence of uh, matrix properties and embedded length on the pullout behavior of yarns in cement calcareous filler matrices. So my presentation will follow uh, this plan. So first, I will talk about the context and objective of the study. Then I will uh, present the materials and method used. Uh, after, I will talk about the pull-out tests performed uh, in this study and the results that we obtained. And then I will talk about the influence of the matrix properties on those pull-out uh, test results. And I will uh, finish with a conclusion. For the context, uh, we want to develop new composites to replace steel reinforcement in concrete. Uh, those new composites are uh, textile reinforced concrete. And this uh, textile reinforcement is made of textile structure that are composed of continuous multifilament yarn that are embedded in fine grain and fluid cement matrices. The main advantages of, of those new composites is that they exhibit no corrosion on the contrary to steel uh, reinforcement and uh, they enable us to create uh, lighter uh, and thinner structures because there is no corrosion and uh, it, is, uh, it has a great ductility, it is easy to be formatted and it is adapted to repair damaged structures. But a main drawback is preventing this technology to be widely used. This drawback is the complex impregnation mechanism by the cementitious matrix. As you can see here, on the, those same images uh, of a split sample of mortar and multifilament yarn, you can see here the filament of the yarn and the mortar uh, matrix. There is a heterogeneous uh, impregnation of the yarn by the matrix. Uh, on the second image, you can see that the solid particle of the matrix are of the same uh, size or even bigger than the uh, space uh, between the filaments. So they can or cannot penetrate uh, between the filaments. And it leads to uh, this heterogeneous uh, impregnation that happen in the section of the yarn, but also along it. So uh, here, uh, the objective of the study is uh, to study the parameter influencing the bond between the multifilament yarn and the matrix. To do so, we will focus on the mechanical behavior of yarn embedded in matrices with low mechanical resistance, and we will perform pull-out tests of a yarn embedded in various matrices with different logical and mechanical properties. So first, uh, the, the yarn that we used was a uh, RA glass multifilament yarn. It means that it is resistant to uh, alkali environment and uh, it is a uh, direct rubbing with a linear density of 2,400 text and its other uh, characteristic uh, can be found here in this slide. For the cementitious matrix, we use a uh, formulation based on uh, standard mortar with a volumic substitution of a portion of cement by calcareous filler. Uh, we use several, uh, we uh, wanted to obtain several biological and mechanical properties by using different volumic water on binder ratio and different substitution percentage of uh, calcareous filler. So here you can see the four mix that we used. The first one, we have a substitution of 50% uh, of the cement, which lead to a fluid matrix with a compressive strength of approximately 30 uh, megapascals. 
and then we increase the volumic substitution. Uh, we have now 30% uh, of cement. We have a uh, rheological property that are similar to the first one, but uh, we divide the compressive strength by three. And for the two over mixed, uh, we use different uh, water on binder ratio to have different um, rheological properties with the same uh, compressive strength. To manufacture the pull-out samples, we first place the yarn in the mold of the mortar specimen, then we cast the mortar. Uh, after 28 days of uh, storage in water, uh, we saw the specimen at the desired embedded length. So as you can see, it's here, the embedded length. And uh, here you have the table of all the sample and all the embedded length that were tested and the number of samples tested for each embedded length. And uh, then we prepare the sample for the pull-out test. And uh, we have a free length of yarn of 10 centimeters for all the sample and an embedded length uh, ca that can vary according to uh, the table here. So the, we perform the pull-out test on uh, this uh, special device. So here you, you can find the free length and here the embedded length. So here, for example, it's uh, one centimeter. And uh, then uh, we have the load displacement uh, curve uh, corresponding to the pull-out test. Uh, despite a very high uh, viability of the result, we have the same profile for the curve for uh, all the samples. So this profile is here. Uh, so it corresponds to a failure in the embedded land, followed by the slippage and extraction of some filament on a displacement equal to the embedded land. And uh, here you can see that uh, we have um, we add a sample of uh, with an embedded length of one centimeter, and uh, there is two phase uh, in uh, this uh, in this curve. So the first phase is a failure, and then uh, extraction of the filament from the matrix. We compute uh, two mechanical parameters on this curve, uh, which are the p max, uh, which is the maximum load, and the p res, which is the regi residual load. Uh, so first, uh, we, we talk about the influence of the embedded length on the pull-out result using uh, samples from uh, one matrix and uh, with four different uh, embedded lengths tested, one, two, four, and eight centimeter. As you can see, there is an increase of the two mechanical uh, parameters with the increase of the embedded length. Uh, but this in increase is not proportional to the increase of the embedded length. Um, this increase is, lo is logical because uh, the number of uh, filament matrix bond increase with the embedded length. So it leads to uh, higher pull-out strength and higher pull-out residual strength to debone and extract the filaments. After the pull-out test, we also uh, uh, weight the extracted mass of filament. To do so, uh, we took the extracting length of yarn. Um, this uh, extracting length is, uh, in all the cases, uh, equal to the embedded length. And we cut it and we weight it to obtain the extracted mass of yarn. It enables us to quantify the sparsely impregnated and or the bonded filaments that are extracted from the matrix. We then use this uh, value and compare it to the pull-out strength and pull-out residual strength. And we divide all the value by the embedded length since we, we saw that uh, the embedded length has an influence on the result. And we can see here that there is uh, no link between the extracted mass and the pull-out test result. So we can make the assumption that the filament extraction mechanism seems to have no influence on the pull-out mechanism. Then uh, we are talking about the influence of the matrix properties 
so the compressive strength of the matrix and its rheological properties on the pull-out test result. Here we compare the two mechanical uh, parameters uh, compute on the load displacement curve of the pull-out test with uh, the compressive strength of the matrix. And here you can see that there is no influence of the compressive strength, so of the density of the matrix on the pull-out uh, mechanism. On the contrary, you, we can see that there is a link between the extracted mass of a yarn after the pull-out test and the compressive strength of the matrix. Here you can say that a higher compressive strength lead to fewer extracted mass. So uh, we can assume that uh, matrices uh, that, uh, that are more dense uh, will lead to uh, uh, blocking, will block the, the extraction of the filaments and it will lead to uh, fewer uh, extracted mass. Uh, and it's also confirmed that the filament extraction mechanism has no significant influence on the pull-out mechanism it is only uh, linked to uh, the density of the matrix that can block the extraction mechanism. On the other end, uh, we can see that there is a link between the rheological properties of the matrix and the pullout result. Uh, here you can see that the Pmax and Pires values um, are linked to the, the workability, which is the, the measure used for the rheological uh, properties of the matrix. And you can see that a higher fluidity of the matrix leads to a better yarn impronation. So a higher filament matrix bond strength and a higher pullout strength and pullout residual strength. So to conclude, uh, we can say that uh, the pullout behavior is lead, linked to the filament organization uh, of the yarn and um, the filaments on mechanical behavior and especially the filament matrix bonds and the extracting mass of filaments after the extraction phase of the pullout test seems to have no significant influence on the pullout test result as we saw. Uh, however, the rheological properties of the matrix and the embedded length of the sample seem to be here the key factors to explain the maximum load and residual load values. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne-Claire. The first of which, did the, all failures are confirmed to have been pull-out failures? There was no tensile failure of the filaments? Um, but I think there is some uh, tensile failures but most of the final years are uh, extraction uh, because when you look at the uh, extracted length, uh, it seems to have a, a cylindrical uh, shape. And uh, also, it's not, uh, I did not present it here, but uh, I've done some uh, resin implantation and dissolution of the matrix to see the shape of the extracted uh, yarn and uh, we determined that it was a uh, cylinder so most of the of the filament are extracted in this case okay good uh, we are missing here it would have been nice to see uh, an actual traditional tensile test on the filaments just to compare with the pull out behaviors on the yarn yes uh, uh, i don't have here but uh, I think it's not on the paper also. No, I, uh, yeah. I have it, but I didn't, uh, I didn't have space to put it in the paper, but okay. Uh, okay. It's, it just looked like um, you, you have a, a, a load uh, increasing and then a decrease, successive decrease with the successive failure of the filament. And then it reached uh, the zero at a displacement of approximately uh, two millimeters. So we don't have the, the extraction phase. Okay, okay. And also, you have a very different number of samples between tests. There was any reason for that? Uh, no, it was only uh, because uh, of manufacturer. We okay. it would be ideal to have uh, this, the same uh, number for each embodiment, but uh, because of uh, 
technical reasons, we couldn't uh, achieve that. Okay, it's because you had a very large scatter of some yes. results, and I think it may have to do with the quality of the filaments. Yeah, uh, there is uh, a high uh, viability for all the tested, even for the same sample with same embedded length, the, the, the viability is really high, so uh, it's really difficult sometimes to, to understand the result, but um, even if I do a more sample, uh, the viability is still high, so... When you use the epoxy resins, it was high? Uh, well? Epoxy resin was just to to visualize the filaments. It was not okay. to uh, to do the test. It was okay. after the full test. Okay. Anyway, very good work. Congratulations. Yes. And let's. I don't know if Professor Harald Muller or Arno Perro have, have questions as well. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, <clears throat> to I, I'm happy to ask a question. A nice presentation. But uh, one decisive parameter is the workability. And you have introduced in the beginning, I don't exactly remember the number of the slide, you showed us a table with the different mixed compositions. Yes, yes. this table. And um, there you have the workability S and uh, I don't know the measurement method. How do you measure the workability? You have given in your paper uh, a norm, no, but this is not known to me. Uh, actually, if we use the um, uh, uh, device, uh, we put a mortar in the device, in the device, and uh, then um, it have a, a square cavity uh, and uh, something blocking the middle of the cavity, uh, and then you you pull out the thing blocking the cavity, and you measure the time for the mortar to reach the other end of the square cavity. Okay, this know. means the dimensions here, you have no dimension, the dimension is some time in seconds or what it is? Uh, yes, it's time in seconds. Ah, yeah, workability in mm -hmm. seconds. Yes. Okay, and eight seconds mean uh, a much uh, lower uh, workability? Much uh, better or, be or better? The three, three seconds is the uh, more fluid and uh, eight seconds is uh, less fluid. Eight seconds is more fluid? No, three seconds is more fluid. Is more fluid, okay. Mm -hmm. huh? Then it's, then I understand it. Okay, and this uh, context, uh, the other point for me is uh, you have at the end a diagram where you have a correlation uh, between uh, the, the, the workability and the average uh, maximum, yes, yes. Uh, this one. And you have here the logarithm of the logarithm on the y on the abscissa, the logarithm of this workability. Uh, yes, because uh, you can use the, the logarithm to, uh, to express the workability, but uh, it's, uh, it's the same. So I'm wondering a little bit if it's a, a log scale that you have equidistance between 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.0. So this is a little bit surprising. If it is a logarithmic scale, yes. it should be different. Or maybe, maybe you check it again. So my, my yeah. point was, if it's a logarithmic scale, yeah, you normally have uh, not equidistances between the 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. So your curve should look a little bit different. This is my point. Okay, I will, uh, I will look. Okay. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I can ask a um, question. And uh, maybe in uh, this uh, figure, in this graph, mm -hmm. you have the result of the um, logarithm of the workability value. That's why you have... Uh, in fact, a linear scale. Mm. Um, so my my question, I think, um, that this kind of reinforcement can, can be efficiently used for a 3D printing application. Yes. And um, what do you think about that? Um, I, I don't have a really... A a lot of knowledge about that, but I know that it can be used. But the problem is how to um, to install it uh, beforehand, or maybe put it uh, in between the 
the things uh, when you do the 3D printing, uh, we have to wonder how to put the yarn, if you want to put it vertically, horizontally, uh, in between the, um, I can't find the word, <laughs> the, the, the layers. The layers, yes, <laughs> sorry. And uh, I know that this is a, a big uh, problem uh, for people working on 3D printing, but I, I don't know much about it. And uh, with the first presentation of Fugas Kebart, perhaps you have uh, one little idea about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. OK. So um, I see a question is, uh, from the audience. Um, you uh, talk about uh, CM1 cement. Um, what do you think about testing uh, other additions like fly ashes? Uh, I know that some uh, existing studies have done that uh, because it is really uh, good for the um, uh, uh, the fluidity of the matrix and the alkali uh, uh, alkali environment. Uh, but since it was already done, uh, I didn't do it. But uh, I think uh, I, I've saw uh, existing study about the subject, and it shows a uh, good result. But uh, I didn't do it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, it's okay for me. Um, I don't know if Joao or Al, you have another question. Well, I can take over uh, the chairing now if you want. Uh, I just have a minor point, but I think it is, uh, anyways, important. Uh, this is what has also said uh, this morning uh, by a colleague of mine. Uh, the workability for you is a very decisive parameter uh, in, in the study. And it's very interesting to see the effects, the pronounced effect of the workability. And I now have learned that uh, this uh, method is a typical one to measure it in France no? uh, from LCPZ. Uh, I have been told now, no? but I was not familiar with it. But it is always very positive yeah, to look on the basics of the physics yeah, if you describe things. And if we look to workability, yeah, the basics in physics is the rheology. Yes. And it is a viscose behavior, a viscosity, uh, which determines the workability. And as you are doing investigations on fine motors, you should have any problems to do uh, measurements with a viscosimeter, and you can correlate. Yeah? For example, your uh, results, the, your pull-out values, no, with the viscosity measured in a, a rheometer. So uh, this gives a, a little bit more a physical background uh, okay. of the results you have shown. This is just a hint for you if you continue your work, no, always to look on the physics behind and to mm -hmm. apply methods yeah, which are not such empirical... I, I know Germany has also a lot of empirical methods mm -hmm. for workability, but more physical is measurements of the biology uh, and the viscosity. Different kinds of viscosity can be determined. And this might give you more insight in the okay. mechanisms which are behind. Okay, thank you. So can we go back to the failure mode of the yarns? There was a, a group of, there were three, uh, uh, photos in the same uh, slide. Yes, this one. This one? So the, the, in the middle of the photos, there was the yarn. So it means that, uh, as far as I understood, uh, so the, the failure mode is that there is a, a pull-out failure for the external fibers of the yarn. Is that right? My question would be that um, uh, how much uh, is, uh, force is anchored in this case, if you can measure or you can calculate with this concept. Can you have an uh, impression for us, uh, for example, the maximum length, uh, the, how much was the anchoring, anchor, anchor force compared to the strength of the yarn? My, the reason of my question that I'm looking for uh, a better solution of uh, anchorages 
um, because if you, so if you, in this case you you don't have a bond or bonding of the fibers you have a group of many fibers if i understand well uh, you have a contact with the uh, f fibers of the yarn only in the ex external layer. Is that right? Uh, we have a, a good bond between the filaments and the matrix for the, yes, for the yes. filaments that are in the periphery, periphery of, the, of the yarn. Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, so if there is any method to um, to integrate the fibers which are internal fibers, we could um, increase the anchoring capacity considerably. This is my feeling. This is not so easy, I understand, uh, but this uh, may be a, a, a second uh, PhD, uh, but um, uh, we were working in this direction actually, um, but in this case the anchorage capacity is much more. Uh, on the other hand, if you have bonding and all in the external fibers of a yarn, uh, if, you, if you apply the load on the yarn, there are uh, relative displacements uh, between the uh, uh, fibers. So the external fibers are bonded and the internal fibers are not bonded. So the, the cross sections of the yarn uh, are deformed. The deformation, the uh, displacement of the yarns is not the same. This is also, also my feeling. So, do you have any opinion on, on that? Um, you mean that you want to improve the encourage of the yarn? But I, the... I was just thinking to improve because in this case you have the, only the contact with the external fibers, which is limited. Yes. It is very limited. You yeah, but the problem is when you increase this uh, anchorage, you decrease the ductibility of the fiber, of, of the composite. And uh, with this uh, decrease of ductibility, you lose the, the sometimes you, you lose uh, the, you lose in maximum load uh, value. So you have a, um, a weaker uh, composite in the, uh, in pull-out test, and uh, you you lose the ductility, and uh, here we used a uh, low resistance uh, matrix to have this ductility, and then to use to repair um, uh, masonry uh, structure and uh, historical building. That's why we focused on uh, the ductility more than uh, the anchorage uh, of the yarn. Mm -hmm. So you had some. Uh, ductility in this place. Yeah. You mm -hmm. have to find a compromise between the good uh, uh, matrix filaments bond and uh, good uh, ductility. And the uh, good ductility is um, so you you, uh, you have an definition of ductility in this case? How much ductility you wait for? Uh, I don't have a specific value but uh, uh, in fact, when I did some tests with uh, uh, stronger uh, uh, matrices with uh, no calcareous filler, only cement, uh, we we didn't have uh, ductility at all. Uh, here, um, yes. we we, exactly. we just uh, had uh, we had the load at zero uh, approximately here, and uh, it wasn't uh, interesting for us. And it was uh, the rupture uh, occur um, uh, here. We didn't have anything to do with the embedded lamp. It, was, it has no influence because ah. the rupture up in the ear, so it, 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 it's equal to a tensile uh, uh, test of a yarn, so it wasn't interesting for the technology. We didn't use the potential of the, the embedded lamp. Um, it is not sure that this was a tensile strength, but um, something relatively close. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not, it was not exactly the same, but it was really close, uh, the same uh, behavior. So we didn't want that. So that's why we used the uh, low uh, resistance matrices. Yes, thank you very much. Congratulate for your research. Thank, thank you. you.